Lembaga keuangan asal Amerika Serikat JP Morgan Chase and Co menyebut para investor harus bersiap atas meningkatnya kembali peluang presiden incumbent Donald Trump kembali menang pada Pilpres Amerika Serikat November mendatang. Menurut salah satu peneliti JP Morgan Chase Marco Kolonovic, peluang kemenangan Donald Trump menguat pasca kekerasan yang meluas di seantero Amerika Serikat dan juga peluang bias dalam jajak pendapat. Marco menambahkan kemungkinan akan ada pergeseran suara hingga 5 Sampai 10 persen dari kandidat demokrat ke republik jika aksi unjuk rasa di Amerika Serikat berubah menjadi aksi kekerasan. Namun catatan tentang debat presiden juga penting untuk diperhatikan para investor. Pemilu Amerika Serikat kian panas, calon presiden Amerika Serikat Joe Biden bahkan menyebut dirinya ingin Amerika Serikat aman dari kepemimpinan Donald Trump. Dalam kampanyenya Biden mengkritik sang presiden yang dianggap tidak becus menangani virus corona. Aksi protes, pengangguran hingga kebrutalan polisi. Kandidat presiden berusia 77 tahun ini berujar tidak seperti calon saingannya, dia tidak sekedar memikirkan ambisinya semata. Dalam kampanyenya dia menyerang juga Trump dari berbagai isu setelah sebelumnya dia hanya fokus kepada cara petahan. The incumbent president is incapable of telling us the truth, incapable of facing the facts, and incapable of healing. He doesn't want to shed light. He wants to generate heat, and he's stroking violence in our cities. Crises under Donald Trump have kept multiplying. COVID, economic devastation, unwarranted police violence. Emboldened white nationalists, a reckoning on race, declining faith. Merespons tudingan Joe Biden terutama untuk kasus kerusuhan dan kekerasan yang terjadi, Donald Trump menilai Joe Biden tidak menyebutkan fakta mendalam terkait kerusuhan yang terjadi. Trump memastikan akan menegakkan keadilan atas kerusuhan dan penjarahan yang terjadi di Amerika Serikat. Under my administration, federal law enforcement is working with state and local authorities. all over the country to comb through hours of video, track down rioters, looters and arsonists and bring them to justice. We've just come up with a report that we've arrested uh, a large number of people. Uh, it's over 200 and uh, you'll be hearing about that, but they've been arrested in various cities throughout the United States. We're doing it very low key, but we're trying to help cities. They are In all cases, Democrat run, but we're doing the best we can to help them without really much of a consent. Jelang pemilu di Amerika Serikat, hubungan kedua calon presiden kian memanas, saling tuding keduanya meramaikan pesta demokrasi di Amerika Serikat. Di sisi lain, bursa future Amerika Serikat bergerak di zona hijau. Hari ini saham-saham teknologi masih menjadi fokus investor. Lantas seperti apa iklim investasi di Amerika Serikat dan kemana arah para investor memasuki bulan September? Untuk membahasnya kami sudah terhubung dengan Thomas Hayes, Chairman and Managing Member Great Hill Capital langsung dari New York. Hi Thomas, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Aline. Yeah, our pleasure. I would like to start with the growing disconnect between the stock market and the U.S. economy. Are you worried about that, especially related to the recent uh, stock rally? Yeah, I think there's a, a consensus that maybe it's getting a little bit toppy. However, there's a tale of two markets. On the one hand, you've had 10 trillion dollars of stimulus aid and liquidity dumped into the stock market, authorized into the stock market to solve a $1.2 trillion GDP contraction. So there is excess stimulus, but you are seeing a little frothiness, particularly in tech stocks. To give you an example, Aline, Apple, which is the favorite stock of the S&P 500, the earnings estimates for 2021 have gone up 4.6% in the last 60 days. However, the stock price has gone up 45% over the same period and 75% for the year. So there are certain pockets of the market that seem to be a little bit uh, heavily valued. However, there's a whole other section of the stock market that's unloved, the laggard sectors, kind of the old world stocks like banks and financials, industrials, energy, et cetera. And I think as we get closer and closer to a vaccine 
and or treatment, which now looks imminent within coming months, you're going to see a huge rotation out of the somewhat overvalued in certain pockets tech stocks into some of the laggard stocks that have been left behind that are trading at very low valuations. Wow, there will be a shifting from the overvalued stock, a tech stock to other laggard sectors. This is interesting. What sectors would be uh, the next rising star in the U.S. stock market? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, if you take Apple is the most loved stock in the S&P 500, probably the most hated stock in the S&P 500 right now is Wells Fargo, which is a bank. And um, if you look at historic multiples, Bank of uh, Wells Fargo trades between one to two times book value historically over the past decade. Right now, it's trading at a 38% discount to book value. So there's a tremendous amount of pessimism. The last time that it traded at this level of discount was 2009. It only did so for a few weeks, and within a couple of months, it traded right back up to book value and the stock appreciated over 100% over that period. So I think right now um, people are just a little bit hesitant until we get the vaccine. Once that happens, you're going to see a, a move into cyclicals. As a matter of fact, we had a Bank of America Global Fund Manager survey come out this month that surveys about 200 managers that run about $500 billion of assets. And they've said that they are starting to rotate into some of the value stocks, some of the small cap stocks, and even some emerging market stocks like Indonesia as the dollar weakens, as demand for commodities picks up, and as inflation uh, slowly, slowly picks up with the Fed backstopping from its speech last week. So for Indonesia stock market, what sector are you looking yeah, I think for the Indonesian stock market in particular, you just want to have a broad exposure to uh, emerging markets on, on the whole, because I think they're going to be the beneficiary of the weakening dollar. I think they're going to be a beneficiary of commodity demand. And certainly you have a demographic, a younger demographic population, which will lead to growth. You know, if you look at the China PMIs this morning, the whole region is starting to recover quickly. Uh, and that's a function of the stimulus. You know, the Chinese government uh, social spending is up 43 percent for the first half of 2020. Uh, they're uh, committed to doing nine million new jobs before the end of the year to maintain unemployment rates at six percent. And that five hundred billion dollar stimulus that they did in May is really starting to filter in particularly in construction and infrastructure. So you're seeing demand for metals, cement, and steel really pick up as they invest in railroads, as they invest in power lines, and electric vehicle charging stations, of all things. So uh, you're seeing it now in the numbers. Even the exports, which is very key for emerging markets, exports in China were up 7.2% in July, which tells us that the developed world, the Western world that got COVID about two months after China is now starting to recover. Their orders are going up and that's going to benefit the whole of the region. So do you think that we're going to see this fast recovery as well in other economies in Asia besides China? Yeah, there's no question about it. And I, I think uh, particularly Indonesia is well situated for the reasons that I told you. You have a younger demography than China does and Japan does. You know, you saw this week Warren Buffett invested $6.2 billion in Japan trading companies, the top five trading companies, which is a major vote of confidence. It says, number one, an interest in commodities, but number two, uh, an interest in, in the entire region uh, and potentially Japan picking up as a major preeminent exporter relative to China as that balance of power potentially starts to shift with the resignation of Shinto Abe. Okay. I would like to go back to Wall Street. So currently, uh, where are you looking at that the Wall Street will be uh, going after this? Because September is known for its wild swings and then also we're getting closer to the election, presidential election in November. What do you think about the stock yeah. market? Some 
people told us that we should be extra, I mean, cautious during this time as we enter September. Yeah, historically, September is a negative month if you look at the averages over time. However, in an election year, it tends to be flat to slightly positive. So uh, it's hard to say. Coming off a huge rally uh, this summer, certainly in August, the best August since 1984, um, you know, you've got a lot of momentum coming in. Uh, historically, it's negative, but in election years, it tends to be slightly positive. So we'll see if that comes to bear this year as it relates to the election itself, Aline. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic. It was pretty well uh, uh, thought of as a foregone conclusion that Biden was going to win just a couple of weeks ago. And in the last two weeks since the passing of the executive order to extend uh, unemployment benefits done by President Trump, and the conventions, President Trump has actually picked up six percentage points in the polls. So now it looks close to a neck and neck race. The number one thing you want to see from a stock market standpoint is it's less important who the president is going to be. It's just more important that you have gridlock. So whether you have a Democratic president or a Republican president, you want to make sure that either the Senate or the House is of the opposite party. What we call it in America is gridlock is a good thing. And that's particularly important for this election cycle because the Biden presidency has committed to raising corporate tax rates from 21% to 28%. Now, David Costin over at Goldman Sachs is expecting S&P earnings to be $170 for 2021. He's a little bit higher than consensus of $166. But he's done the math, and he says if Joe Biden is elected in a blue sweep, meaning the president is Democratic, the Senate is Democratic, and the House is Democratic, and he could actually affect the tax raises, that would take $20 of earnings off the S&P 500. So the earnings for 2021 would go from 170 down to 150. And with that uh, level of growth slowing, if that was the case in the case of a blue sweep, uh, the multiple would also come down. And we've calculated that would potentially lead to a 25 to 30 percent correction in the stock market. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is we don't think that's going to happen. So whether so Biden Trump wins is better for Trump the market, wins, we do. Uh, gridlock is better for the market. Yes, generally it's accepted on Wall Street that a Trump presidency is more business friendly. But the most important thing we need to see is gridlock. So whether Trump wins or Biden wins, one of the other houses, either the Senate or uh, Congress, has to be the other party so that they don't increase the corporate tax rate. But as far as your direct question, uh, how does Wall Street perceive it? Wall Street would like to see President Trump be elected because his policies are more business friendly, leaving aside the social uh, issues, et cetera, from a business and a stock market standpoint, the policies are more friendly to business. So we'll see what happens. But historically, Aline, if you have a gridlock, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican president, the stock market tends to do very well as long as one party doesn't have complete power. So that's what we're hoping for in November. And it looks very promising that that will be the case, which will be very, very good for the stock market. Okay. It's getting more interesting. We will continue this interview after the break, so stay with us, Thomas. Kami akan kembali untuk Anda dengan closing bell. Tetaplah bersama kami di CNBC Indonesia.